Bridget Butler, who is also known as the Bird Diva, did not originally have a passion for birds. In this episode, she tells us about the wow bird that sparked her interest and which ultimately led her to the practice of slow birding. And a quick reminder, the October Big Day is coming up. The Casual Birder podcast is entering a team for the event and I'd love you to be part of it. We'll each be birding in our own areas on Saturday the 14th of October, but we'll share our eBird checklists to the team account. There will also be some exclusive virtual team meetups. Once again, we're raising funds for BirdLife International. Thank you so much to those who've already contributed. You can find the links to the sign-up form for the team and for the fundraiser in the episode notes. And now, let's hear from Bridget. Welcome to the Casual Birder podcast. I'm Susie Buttress. As a casual birder, I take pleasure in watching the wild birds around me, wherever I am. In my show, I share the joy of birding. I tell you about the birds I've seen, speak with experts and enthusiasts, go on bird outings, and I share stories from birders around the world. Last episode, I shared the first in the series recorded live at Global Bird Fair. I spoke with Becky Spate, Chief Executive of the RSPB, and Patricia Zarita, former CEO of BirdLife International and now Chief Strategy Officer with Conservation International. They share their insight as women leaders in conservation and emphasise the importance of collaboration and inclusivity to address the challenges facing our natural world. We also hear about how they would each spend a fantasy birding day. Do take a listen. I can't quite remember where I first came across Bridget Butler, the bird diva. It may have been on the Birding Life podcast where she was interviewed. I do remember being very intrigued by the practice of slow birding that she teaches. It seemed quite a radical idea. Rather than a traditional birding outing, where usually as many species are sought as possible, slow birding provides an opportunity to pause, listen and engage with the natural world letting the birds show themselves, rather than us seeking them, and being content with the quality of observation instead of the quantity of species on our checklists. Slowing down provides opportunities for contemplation, creative expression, perhaps through writing or drawing, and nurtures a deep connection with the natural world. Slow birding is many-faceted, so I'll let Bridget explain more. A quick note that I recorded this episode with Bridget back in January 2023. She mentioned some upcoming events for the year, so some of them may already have passed. But there's plenty more coming up in the world of the bird diva. Bridget, it's absolutely wonderful to have the opportunity to speak with you again. We had a private chat last year. Can't believe it's already a year ago. We covered so many topics and I really wanted to share those topics with my listeners. And I know this is a big year for you. There's lots going on in bird diva land. So let's start. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Susie, thank you so much. It's great to have another opportunity to talk to you. I know that first conversation that we had together, I felt like we needed more time and like some coffee or tea or something to like sit with each other. Um, And I'm really happy to bring some of that conversation to your listeners. So um, who am I? I am Bridget Butler. I live in Northwestern Vermont. So right along the Canadian border near the shores of Lake Champlain. Um, The beautiful green mountains are like, you know, to the to the east of me and to the west is the the shoreline of the lake um, in the community where I live. Um, I'm known as the bird diva in the birding community here in the States. And I have a small business where I do um, outreach and presentations and things like that around birding and specifically around um, slow birding. Um, And it's a an approach that has developed for me over a number of years that um, it's just a little different than traditional birding. And um, I'm now bringing it to people through courses and um, outings and workshops and things like that. And um, it's been really great to find my people 
And I know that's something that you and I talked about, and it's evident in the title of your work, The Casual Birder, right? So there's something going on there for you that you needed to put that extra word onto birder or birding, in my case, to find your place in the community. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, for me, I guess it came from a position of feeling insecure about what I knew. You know, I'm not an expert. I'm not a professional ornithologist. I'm just someone who has a real passion for birding and absolutely loves hearing stories from others and, you know, building that community. And that's been one of the most amazing parts of the podcast. I'm really pleased that I call myself the casual birder, although, you know, just having the show means that I'm getting to be a better birder all the time. So you know, at some point, I guess that word won't work. But um, currently, I'm very happy I chose that. I think you should stay casual all the time, right? There's often this like striving that happens. Um, and I have felt it too in just leading outings and things like that, that I have to know everything all the time and be able to convey that. And I think once we free ourselves from that, that's like when this true... Um, learning from like genuine curiosity really starts to bloom. And that's when it gets really good, I think. Tell me how we got into birding. Yeah. So for me, like, and it's so funny because a lot of folks are like, oh, you must, you must have birded since you were a kid. And, and I'm like, nope, that wasn't my thing when I was a kid. I definitely was a kid that was like out on the land after school, like romping and stomping in the woods and the streams and all of that kind of stuff. So that's deep within my identity and my being is, is that oh, almost daily connection with the land. Um, and I went to school for marine science, marine biology. So that was like my next big passion were, you know, fish and invertebrates and all kinds of things like that. My grandmother definitely had bird feeders. And so she also lived on Cape Cod and in the state of Massachusetts. So that really cool little spit of land that comes out into the Atlantic ocean there. And, um, that's probably where my love of marine biology came from. And she also had bird feeders up. And so that was part of her daily routine was getting up in the morning, making breakfast, sitting with the birds. Um, and so I think probably some of it rubbed off then. But I didn't like birds and birding. So I went to school for marine biology. I didn't get into birds um, in school. I wasn't really interested in, in that. And it wasn't until after I got out of college and I started working for different nature centers, um, that even the concept of birding as something kind of an exclusive hobby, right. Focused on one, you know, family of, or order of, of animals came into my, you know, I, I was able to recognize that. And I didn't like birders. I think I told you this before. <laughs> It's such a weird place to come from and a weird story to say, but I worked for a number of different um, nature centers across New England. And every time I ran into birders, they were they were a bit arrogant. They were competitive. Um, they were very guarded with their knowledge. Um, and I was also working for Audubon centers at that time. And so there was this judgment that was happening that if I worked for an Audubon center, I needed to know about birds. And my specialty was marine biology at the time. So I was more into ecology and all the things that were in the water than, than the birds. Um, and so I didn't have a good introduction into the, the community. And it wasn't until I moved to Vermont many, many years later down the road in my career. And I was working for Audubon Vermont, that I found this community of people, of birders, who were much more open and excited to share their knowledge and excited to excite you about birds, that I really started to fall in love with birds and birding. My wow bird? Did I tell you about my wow bird ever? I don't think you did. Do you have this concept where you guys are love like a spark bird of a wow bird, the bird that hooks you? Well, I've only learned it from people that I've spoken to in America, but it absolutely is a feature of, of birding for a lot of people. So do tell me. Yeah. So my wow bird was the indigo bunting, 
which is like a really incredibly blue sparrow sized bird that lives in like shrubby, scrubby fields and stuff. And it was on my first um, uh, birdathon that I was doing for Audubon, Vermont. And we slept out on the property there. And a birdathon, we go, you bird for 24 hours and you raise money for an organization or a, or a cause. And um, we slept out on the property and I was sleeping in my tent overnight. And this is when I wasn't really great at birding yet. I don't even think I had my own pair of binoculars yet. So I was probably borrowing something from the nature center. And I heard this very loud, repeated um, vocalization early in the morning um, before anybody else had gotten up. And I unzipped my tent and I kid you not, I was on the edge of that. There's a small little orchard set of apple trees there and they were in bloom. So beautiful, pale pink, white petals. And at the top of the tree was the indigo bunting. The male in all of that gorgeous blue, just singing that. So fire, fire, where, where, here, here, quick, quick, all these like little doublets. And I had no idea what it was, but I was absolutely captivated. And I was like, how do you get to be that blue? Like, what is going on with that? And who are you? And right. And somebody gave me the name, but it took years to really get to know that bird. But that's like, that was my, that was my spark bird. And that's kind of what started it all. Oh, wow. What a story. And I could picture it as you were talking about, you know, the pink blossoms and the blue of the bird. I love the color blue. So I, I'm desperate to see all blue birds. And whenever I come over to America, you know, they're the birds I want to see. You know, we have some blue birds here, but nothing like you have. And so an indigo bunting is, is definitely on my list. Well, if you ever come and visit me in Vermont, I will, I will help you find one. Thank you. <laughs> Going back to what you said about um, the community that you found there in Vermont and how that really welcomed you in. It just struck me about how important it is that we are welcoming to people who are entering birding or even people who don't yet know that they're going to be birders. Yeah. Because just having that welcoming feeling that, you know, anyone can take part, anyone can enjoy looking at birds and you don't have to be super knowledgeable when you start, you know, just having an interest is is enough. But having people around you that encourage you is so, so important. And it really showed from what you said there, you know, you'd had years of thinking, yeah, yeah, birds, but you know, not really for me. And then when you were welcomed into a community, it gave you that warmth and that feeling that, yeah, actually this could be for me. I think it's a really great exercise in in kind of identifying what it is to be inclusive, an inclusive community, right? Is really thinking about those times when you haven't felt welcomed. And I, you know, I have a definite storyline in my head of when I didn't feel welcomed into learning about birds. And then I have, I know the point in my, in my trajectory and my evolution of birding as a practice of when I felt welcomed. And that group of people, we were all kind of learning together. And I think that's the other thing that was really interesting is that that time that I spent with Audubon Vermont, we were, we were really thinking deeply as an organization about what, what, what our purpose was and how we wanted to connect people to birds and bird conservation. And all of us came into work there with all of these different experiences. And none of us, except for the field biologists, were like expert, and I'm going to do the air quotes thing. <laughs> they weren't, we weren't all expert birders. But what was great is we were all learning together and, and supporting each other in our own um, kind of extension of knowledge, like getting bits and pieces together. And the the field biologist that was there, Mark, he was he was great, right? He held a lot of knowledge, but he didn't hold that knowledge over others. He was very welcoming in the way he helped all of us kind of get to this level where we could um, talk about birds and share birds with our constituents within that organization to take them to this next level of conservation. I think that's so important as well is that sharing, because you don't know what spark you're, you're starting by sharing. And, you know, it could be the great the next great conservationist right and even if it's not even if it's someone who's just enjoying the birds in the backyard that's still valid and they're still a birder yes and this is the thing right is like how I think this gets at that inclusivity piece is it's like 
how do we include people and make them feel welcome regardless of where they're at in terms of their knowledge or their motivation? Some people enjoy birding because of the health benefits, right? Like I feel good after I bird. There are endorphins and things that are released and it it makes me feel better. Um, Some people like the social aspect of it. Some people are listers and really like being able to see that list grow and evolve. And some people are out there um, e-birding, right? To be able to feel like they're contributing back. And I think all of those things are valid, but I think part of what we've gotten stuck in is showing people like that there's just one path. And what you're doing through your podcast and your work and by just calling yourself the casual birder, I get so excited about that, is that it's all valid. It's it's all okay. And so I think that's the next layer to birding and conservation is thinking about how we can be more inclusive and include some of these other people in who like slow birding, who like casual birding, and giving them permission to be part of this community as well. Because I don't think we've done a very good job of that. Now, you mentioned slow birding there. Could you tell me some more about it? What is slow birding? Yeah. So for me, um, this term really evolved over time. And, you know, I, I spent a number of years at Audubon, Vermont, working very focused on birds and bird conservation. So it was very science driven. Um, and and that that was the, the mindset and the intention that I had through that work. And what I was finding as I was doing that work is that there was a personal aspect to birding that wasn't coming through in that and that I wasn't seeing in the bird outings that I was going on. And so this was kind of like in the early 2000, 2010, maybe somewhere in there that I started to really look at what do I value about birding and what does it do for me? And one of the big things that pushed me into thinking about slow birding Um, was bird behavior. I was really interested in the whole story of birds and not just the identification piece. And I was craving that kind of offering from other organizations, from bird walks, from bird outings or workshops. And I wasn't finding it. And if I was, it was very heavily steeped in the science world, which is great, right? But I was looking for something else. There was And I think it probably goes back to my childhood, right? That childhood connection of being able to romp and stomp and rip around on the land and the joy that you felt out of that. I was looking for that kind of connection, that kind of relationship. And so as I started to really think about this more, I sought out different folks to kind of connect with. And I started um, reading some of John Young's work on bird language And using sit spot method of staying in one place and visiting that place over and over again, over time, through the seasons, all of that, and getting to know the birds that were there and their vocalizations and how they were telling you through how they moved on the land and how they um, vocalized about what was going on. And that's where things really shifted for me. And I was like, oh, I'm slowing down. That's how I put those two terms together. And so over time, I just kept kind of seeking out what are these bits and pieces. So for me now, slow birding is really a a reimagining of how we connect with birds. It's going back a little bit deeper into this innate connection that we have with land and nature through our senses. And what I found is that traditional birding teaches you how to observe to get to identification. And slow birding teaches you how to observe in order to get to relationship and connection. That's where the joy is for me. So shifting to thinking about birding in this way, sitting in one place and waiting for the birds to come back in around me or not keeping a list or not worrying about whether or not I completed a whole trail to get all the birds was risky and different within the birding community. And I slowly started to talk about it. Um, Fortunately, I get to do a radio show with our local public radio station twice a year. And I started having those conversations um, on the radio with folks. And it really opened things up 
like, I was like, oh no, people want this. There are people out there that are craving this type of connection. And that's where the programs came from and the courses and all of that was just really thinking about how can we get into observation in a deeper way, looking and listening? How can I bring some relationship thinking around birds and birding and our connection with nature and the land back in because we are a part of nature. And I think we've become so detached from that. And then the the other piece was was really just kind of about celebrating community, right? Finding these birders. And it goes back again to that inclusive piece. There were people over and over again, and you've probably experienced this too, right? You're out in public or you're at a gathering and people ask what you do and you're like, oh, this is what I do. And they're like, oh, you must be a birder. You must be really good. Oh, well, I don't know what really good is and what you're thinking that is. And, they're, and then they'll say to you, I'm not a birder, but, and then they'll go into this long, amazing story, right? About birds. See, I could see it in your face. You're like, yes, yes, I've had Absolutely. this. Absolutely. That is exactly what happens. Right? And so for some reason, those people feel like they don't belong. And that's really what I want to provide for folks is this space to explore their connection with birds in whatever way works for them. And I'm just going to put out to you what has worked for me and what I'm experiencing along the way. And you can take it and make it your own, or you can take it and be like, Ooh, this is, this is where I want to go. Hello, Nick Patel here from Wilder Skies, the podcast. I'm a birder, a conservationist and a tour guide for Wilder Skies, Somerset Nature Tours. But as for the podcast, it's a place where we talk about birds, wildlife and all the hard hitting conservation topics on the top of everyone's minds right now. Each episode, we delve into different guests from all areas of the nature sphere. We talk about serious topics, we laugh a little and dig into some of their favourite species and parts about wildlife. So when you take groups out to experience slow birding, how do you do that? Do you talk about it before you go out? Um, obviously, they will have read about what's the walk going to be like or what's the course going to be like. But what aspects do you include in that? Do you include drawing? Do you include just keeping your eyes shut and listening? Oh, yeah. There's lots of layers to this. And I'm so I'm still experimenting with this. Right. So heads up to anybody who comes out with me in a way. You were part of a grand experiment. You know, I think there's like the traditional bird walk where everybody gathers and you say hi, and then the, everybody gets out their phones to get eBird going, or they've got like little notebooks, right? And then you do the trail and you see as many birds as possible and somebody's interpreting what you see and then you come back, right? So for me, it's about, now I call it like outcome-free birding. We're going to set a different intention. and. I got to tell you, I love this because people aren't expecting it when they come on what they think is going to be a bird walk or a bird outing. And I've learned over time how to frame the experience that helps people try something different while at the same time acknowledging that this might feel uncomfortable. <laughs> and it is, it's really uncomfortable for some people. I, I, you know, I can remember a couple of outings last year where you know, I, I framed the start of the walk. We do the thing. We do the greeting. We welcome people. Um, I try very hard as a as a guide not to get caught up in the friends that arrive, right? Like all my my birding friends, the people that I know, and make sure I'm paying attention to each person as they come into the group. I frame the start of the outing as we're going to do some outcome free birding. And this might be really different for you. It may feel a little bit uncomfortable. It might be an edge for you. And people are like, oh, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is we're going to go for a walk together and we're going to um, get to know who's here today in terms of the birds, but we're not going to write them down. And I'm not going to keep an eBird list. And you can see people get really tense <laughs> and they're like, oh no, what am I going to do? Cause I'm not going to know all the birds and I'm not going to have a list at the end. And I, and I, and I acknowledge that, like, I can see that this is really different for some of you. And, um, I'll ask them how they're feeling, right? Like we do this, like thumbs up, thumbs down somewhere in the middle thing. And I'm like, so tell me about how that feels for you. Where is that landing for you kind of thing? And some people are really uncomfortable with it. And I allow them, right. You, 
you can stay or you can go. If this doesn't work for you, that's fine. And there's plenty of places to explore, right? And so the outing starts off with us walking together and getting to know the birds. And then we're going to move into a little sit spot session together and debrief, right? Afterwards, a sharing session, right? Might be a nicer way to put it. But when we walk together to begin with, the other piece that I ask people to try to experiment with is if you're a really um, experienced birder and the birds here are familiar to you, I'm going to ask you to do two things. One, before you name the bird out loud to the whole group, I'd like you to get one other person on the bird, help somebody else find the bird and get their binoculars on it. I bring binoculars for everybody. I think that's another barrier to participation. So I have a whole, I have 12 pairs of binoculars I bring out on all my outings. I have um, portable chairs that I bring on all of my outings. So if you don't have like a stool or something you can bring with you, I've got one for you. So I'm taking away all of those barriers to participation. The other thing that I ask people to do is, so you're going to help somebody get on the bird. And then you're going to describe what you see to that person. You're not going to say what it is. Try not to, but you're going to describe what you're noticing. I notice this bird is about the size of a chickadee, like the chickadees behind me here. Or um, I notice this bird has like a black cap and a black throat, right? So start talking about what you're noticing about the bird out loud. And what's really cool about that, there's a, a term for it. It's called the production effect. It actually cements in your brain deeper those field marks and characteristics that you're looking at than if you don't say those things out loud. It's even better than if you write them down. So saying them out loud and saying them out loud with somebody else also allows that person to notice things in a similar way without getting stuck on what the ID is, right? So when we start to worry about what the identification of the bird is, everything tenses up. And we've even discovered too doing this that when you name the bird right away, it kind of shuts down your experience in your brain. Keep asking questions about that bird. If you name it right away, you're kind of shutting down people's experience framing the start of an outing in that way is a really interesting way to create community around learning because it gives the experienced birders something to do that serves the rest of the group and does it in a way that people aren't going to shut down their own curiosity. That's really, really interesting because as you were describing, say, the black-capped chickadee and describing it in terms of, you know, its plumage, possibly you might be describing its behavior um, I can absolutely see how people learning that will remember those things, you know, look out for it, picking into a, a pine cone and, and finding a seed. I, I just think that's a really ingenious way of framing your outings, because as you say, the experienced people, they would be the ones that are likely to want to just tick and list and, and whatever. But by asking them to describe it and help someone else to see it, suddenly they're probably seeing the bird in a whole new way again. It is very easy once you know a bird well to just, yep, that's a black bird, that's a blue tip, you know, whatever. But taking the time to actually watch them, their behaviour, how they interact with each other, how they interact with the environment and how they interact with other species or how they behave when other species are around, it's so much more fulfilling. Yeah, it's magical. I think that other thing I was just thinking as you said that out loud about, oh, it's just a... It's just a chickadee, right? So for somebody that's in the group that have a, hasn't ever experienced chickadee before, you've already assigned a value to that bird based on your behavior, right? So that's the other piece of creating inclusive experiences for people. Um, it's And that's hard. I mean, that's hard work to do um, as a guide and as a participant too. So when we go on these outings together, if we want to build this inclusive bird community, how can we be better participants as well and think about learning in community together? As you said at the beginning, there are a lot of layers to this. And, mm. and I'm guessing you're doing a lot of research along the way to, to know what works and what doesn't work apart from your, your trials as you're going out. Talk about lifelong learning. This was the other big part of my the evolution of my practice was doing the research 
in those places about those things that made me uncomfortable. So why was I feeling like I didn't belong? What was it about my birding practice that I needed the freedom to be able to practice? And that was sitting in one place, spending time with one bird, like sticking around for the whole story, like not just being like, oh, chickadee, great, I'm on to the next thing. The chickadee's doing something really cool there and no one's paying attention to it. Right. So I started to pay attention to those things. And it really got me thinking a lot about am I birding differently because I'm female, my gender? Right. And we talk a lot about um, the birding community being dominated by white, cis males. Right. And actually, when we look at the actual data from some different surveys that Cornell has done, at least in North America, the bird watching community is 56% women. But the perception is, is that it's dominated by men. So I wanted to know about what was different about my own experience. And I started to look at where are the women in history that, are, that were birders? Because there's got to be some out there. And so I started to find women from all the way back in the Victorian era Who's, who had done extensive writing and work around birds and bird behavior and just studying birds and being with them. Um, and I found these women, some of the first that were inducted into the American Ornithological Union, um, Florence Miriam Bailey, Mabel Osgood Wright, and Olive Thorne Miller. And the thing that all of them did that I was doing was just that. It was local. It was going out on the land. It was staying in one place. It was visiting the same place over and over again to experience the birds in their daily lives. Um, and I got so excited because I felt validated. Once again, I felt like I found my people. I found where I belonged. And then I got really frustrated because I was like, no one's telling these stories. No one's talking about these women the way that they should be talked about. And we've lost this thread of connection with birds that was totally evident in their work. So for me, really slow birding goes all the way back to Florence Miriam Bailey and Mabel and Olive, right? That's where it all started. And so I'm not really inventing anything new. I'm embracing... Um, deep observation that has always really, truly been a part of being a human being. Whereabouts are you taking slow birding? Um, so where is slow birding going for me? I, I think my big focus this year is just on building community and trying really hard to connect more people in this way. Um, my year is full of great events this year. I'm so excited. I'm going to be at the biggest week in American birding talking about slow birding out in Ohio. Um, I'm keynoting the Acadia Birding Festival in Maine. Um, lots of great opportunities to kind of bring this contemplative, mindful birding, um, you know, to more people. And, and this is the thing, Susie, is like, I keep hearing from people, like the comments that come back are often, you've given me permission isn't that such a sad thing that people need permission to be able to experience birds in their own way? And so I think this next year is really about building community. So I'm looking at not only continuing like the courses and um, the workshops and things like that, but trying to build an online community where folks can come and be a part of conversations like this, where we can learn together that it's not just about me, right? Like I want to empower people. I don't want people kind of, I don't know. I think sometimes we take our burning mentors or heroes and we put them up on these pedestals. Don't I don't want to be up there. I want to be hanging out down on the ground with everyone and sharing a lot of stories. So I'll be building community in that way. And then I'm also working with this great new group here that's come out of the the states called the Mindful Birding Network, which is a group of people that's meeting every other month or so 
to talk about burning in this way and to highlight each other's work. And so that's the other piece that I'm really interested in is elevating other people's work who are doing the same thing like yours. Like listen to Susie's podcast and you're going to get something completely different. Um, you know, hang out with um, Holly Merker, who is the author of Ornotherapy, and you're going to find a whole different aspect to birding. Um, Kelly Sue O'Connor, who's from Canada, is doing this great work. Um, her um, handle online is called Birder Brain, and she is going out and videotaping, creating these beautiful, like little short films about people and their connection with birds and how it's helped them with mental illness and mental health, all those types of things, um, just wellness and well being. Um, so she's doing some great work. So for me, it's about community and making sure that there's more folks that know that this is all okay. It's okay to bird in this way. It's totally fine. You know, I think when it comes to wellness and nature connection, a lot of us got a big wake up call during the pandemic. Um, you know, having to stay at home, be in one place, um, the, the only way that you could get out was to find some natural area to go to where you could spread out enough um, so that you could be safe. Uh, and for me, wow. And I can feel it in my body right now. I think about how my birding practice helped me cope with those long times of being on lockdown. Um, I had anxiety attacks for the first time during the pandemic that I have never experienced anything like that before. This like need, like just being completely uncomfortable and wanting to get out of just being in that, in that moment. And what helped me was to get back into my regular routine of my sit spot practice, 20 minutes a day, at least. Right. And that seems like a lot, maybe to sit in one place for that amount of time. The more you do it, the longer the sits get, right? Because it, it just, everything starts to open up. But during that time, those, that taking that time out and putting everything down and aside and just bringing my journal out with me and allowing the birds to call me into awareness and just focusing on me and them and what they could give me and that I could give them my attention in that moment. Now I'm feeling it in my body again. I can feel everything just go. <sighs> no, I, I did that this morning with um, Milliated Woodpecker, which is our, one of our biggest woodpeckers, right? We're talking like almost a foot in length when you see them on the tree trunks. I was like getting a whole bunch of stuff together and, you know, trying to get ready for talking with you today and all of that. And I had gotten my kids off to school, right? So there's all those things like running through my head and the pileated woodpecker comes and lands on the tree right outside my window here. And I didn't have my glasses and I thought, oh, I should go run and get my glasses. And I was like, nope, you don't need your glasses to enjoy this. You don't need your binoculars to enjoy this bird. And I took a couple of deep breaths and um, yeah, and I'm smiling right now because I can feel that feeling of watching that bird just work the tree and pick at different crevices and fleck the bark off the tree and how it could not only hop up the tree and prop itself up with its tail, but also go backwards. And I was like, wow, you're really, you got this down and then around the bottom of the tree very thoroughly. And my, my brain, my other traditional birder brain kept kicking in and being like, go get your glasses, go get your binoculars. And I was like, no, like stay in this moment. And each time that would happen, I would take another breath and just be like, I'm so lucky that I'm here in this moment with this bird. That's a great example of how much my birding hobby or birding job has changed into a practice and that it's given me all these other gifts other than just knowledge about birds. When you're out with the group and you're doing like a sit spot, all of us will know that there are some birds that are just, you know, they're for a moment and gone. Mm. So are there some birds that lend themselves to being able to be observed for longer periods? Because, you know, if it's a, a bird that's there and gone, it's quite hard to get other people to see it or take time to describe it. So have you got certain species that lend themselves to your outings? Oh my gosh, that's such a great question. And I think what's crazy that's going through my mind is that sometimes when you sit still, those birds often that 
that seem like they flit and they leave and they're gone, they stick around a bit longer or you get better looks at them. So um, I'll back it up and I'll say, so yes, I would say there's probably some good birds that lend themselves to sit spots um, in my classes and workshops and stuff, I talk about our usual suspects, who are the birds that we can see on a day-to-day basis that we can get to know. And that can be something like um, a pigeon, right? Maybe some of us are in an urban environment, so it could be pigeon. You know, my backyard usual suspects right now are dark-eyed junco, black-capped chickadee, well, that pileated woodpecker apparently is around the neighborhood, um, and probably tufted titmouse is another one. So I really encourage people to start with like what's there and close at hand. So feeder birds are great. Um, City birds. mm, We have European house sparrows that are city birds, starlings, pigeons, things like that, that are going to be right around um, that you can see on a regular basis. I like um, ground birds too. Anybody that hangs out a lot on the ground, I think of our sparrows and our thrushes, things like that. And that being said, I'm thinking back of this summer when I had a participant on one of these outings who is skeptical about both the um, the guidelines for the start of the walk, right? The we're not going to name and we're going to try to help each other out and we're not going to keep a list. Um, and then also the sit spot part, um, they were a little bit skeptical about that. And it was during the time of year when we have lots of warblers and warblers are like the eye candy during migration, spring migration, and even during early summer before they're right down on nest. And so the drive for most of the birding community is to see those birds. And if you're not covering ground on a walk or an outing to be able to get to the next bird and see those, right? This, it builds a lot of anxiety (laughs) within some birders. So this was a person who was, who was kind of there. And what happened is we all spread out and sat on the land. And when we came back to share what we experienced, they had an experience with a warbler that they had never seen before because it came back into this little shrub bank that they were sitting in and it was within two to three feet of them. Wow. Yeah. So to say it works better with these birds or it works better, I don't, I think it can work great with anything. It's just that shifting of intention and everything slows down and the birds come back in around you. And it could be all those ones that you've just been hoping to see. So put yourself in a place with them where you can truly be with them and not just look at them. One of the things you mentioned there was, you know, birds coming to feeders. So this is a practice that you could try in your own garden or a park that you're used to going to. The idea of having some way that you just sit and let the birds come to them. I think I told you last time, one of my best ever birding days was uh, when we were in Mexico and we were staying in a, a little casita and had a mature garden. And I went out there at dawn and just watched to see what birds were around. And I pretty much didn't move from that garden until dusk. Honestly, every moment a new bird was turning up because there was water in the garden. So they'd been used to coming to these water baths. But for me, where every bird was pretty much a brand new bird to see, it was just fabulous. And of course, while you're sitting there, there will be times when the birds will disappear and, you know, then there'll be a little shuffle somewhere in the, the bottom of a bush or something and you know something will come out again. But those moments, you know, you're just sitting there, you are calm, but you're hopeful, but it does make you listen. It does make you like ultra aware of what's going on. I really sort of feel an empathy for what you're describing. Now, you mentioned that your um, courses you do, are they all in-person courses or do you do online courses? Yeah, so uh, it's a combination. So what's been, what was great is before the pandemic started, I, I experimented with my first online course and, and it went well, right? We did a couple of weeks um, where uh, folks would get emails and then we would meet online together once a week for a discussion session together. And, you know, wouldn't you know that that just exploded after the pandemic? And so now during the year, I offer intro to slow burning twice. And then there's always a couple of other like next level courses after you get like the first level and you get your practice down. 
So it, it's probably between five and six different courses a year. And most of them last like five weeks. And you get a prompt um, each week with some information. So there's like a theme for the week. And then we meet once a week together online for an hour and a half, two hour discussion. And it's story sharing and it's learning together in community. It's not me giving you a presentation. <laughs> so it's participants bring their stories in and we share them and I help facilitate things in a way that we can get the most out of it that we can together. And then workshops happen too, um, half day, full day. I'm going to host a week weekend um, here in the Northeast Kingdom, which is on the other side of the northern part of Vermont, where I am in this beautiful set of lodges. And we'll spend the weekend kind of fine-tuning our practice and, and being on the land there. So lots of different options and opportunities, and including online options. And I'm hoping within the next month to get my new online community, Slow Burning Community, launched and so that will also have, right, like it's an online forum where people can share stories and discuss together, but there will also be online um, events that you can join. And what I've enjoyed so much, and like, this is how you and I have connected too, right? Like we found each other <laughs> across an ocean. Um, I am finding people all over the world that I don't know how exactly they're finding me, but it, somehow they found slow birding. And I had the joy of having people from you know, England and France and New Zealand and Australia and South Africa in my courses. And it's allowed me to get to know their birds. And that's what's great about slow birding is it's like, I don't have to be the expert in your birds to bring you slow birding. And you don't have to like spend all this time studying really hard to develop this practice. So it's been amazing for me as well to be able to connect with people in other faraway places and get to know their birds as well. With people joining from around the world and with the issues of time zones, I asked Bridget how she handles that. All the discussions are recorded um, and there's plenty of, of things that you can grab from so that if you can't join the live sessions, you can watch them afterwards. And of course, I'm always available. People send me stories midweek. They're like, I couldn't make the talk. I couldn't make the discussion session, but you're not going to believe what happened. And they'll send me these really great emails of like whatever their story is from the week. Um, it's important to be able to share those things. I think that's the other thing that happens is right? And I'm going to go back to the science, right? There's all of these things that happen in our bodies, all these different chemicals, dopamine, you know, the endorphins, all of that, that are released when we have these experiences of awe, but also when we share them with somebody else. And then it deepens that memory, it deepens that connection. So if you are all about identification, these stories and the sharing of stories creates a really great, basically like a file system in your head <laughs> that's like subconscious that you could tap in on any time. So for me, slow birding not only elevated my skills as a traditional birder, but also took me to this other place as a mindful contemplative birder as well. What would your ideal or best birding day look like? Okay, so I'm hoping for one tomorrow. And sometimes it's not a whole day because as a mom with three kids, I don't always get the whole day. That's the other piece of letting go, right? That you can practice in birding is, is having like the perfect session or finding the rare bird that you wanted to see is how can I be super open to whatever nature presents for me? So my plan <laughs> to have a, a wonderful birding morning for myself in the winter. Um, when I go out, my sit spot is right outside my door, but if I am going to plan time to be away from my house and away from this sit spot, I have satellite. I call them my satellite sit spots. They're the places that I, I like to go and sit. And so it's winter here in Vermont, which for some people, it's really hard to get outside, but I think with enough planning and prep, you can totally do that. So I'll dress for the weather. It's it's like a bluebird day out here. It's blue sky. It's beautiful right now. So I'm hoping tomorrow will be the same thing. 
but I'll pack my slow burning kit. And that's my backpack that has my, I have a little collapsible chair stool, right? That I can just sit on. It's really small. So it fits into my pack. Um, I have a fleece blanket. Mm-hmm. Birding with blankets is a thing. So I have a fleece blanket that rolls in there and sits in there. And then I have a couple of different types of thermoses that I use. So I have teas that I like for burning. So a ginger tea or a peppermint tea, right? And so really hot in a nice thermos that goes in next to the blanket. Mm, So the blanket gets warmed up. It's really good. And oftentimes the other thing that I like to do is, is pack a lunch. There is something about, it's like going to lunch with a friend, right? I'm sharing a meal in this space with the land and with the birds that are going to come in around me. And I'll tell you, food tastes a thousand times better when you're slow burning (laughs) and you're eating. So my perfect winter birding day will be to take that pack and grab my cross-country skis and spend that time without my technology. The phone will be in the backpack so I can't access it. Put that on silent and just go out to one of my favorite satellite spots, which is by a lake. And I have a rock there. Actually, it's two rocks. I call them the sister rocks. And I like to visit them through all the seasons. There's a pileated woodpecker that hangs out up there and maybe I'll see her tomorrow, but it's a beautiful spot. And I'll ski out to that and set up and sit without expectation. This is a really hard thing to right? Like, so I've planned this time to go connect with the birds. And of course I want to see birds. I'm the bird diva, but I'm not going to be bummed if I don't see birds because there will be the beautiful landscape. I'll have my peppermint tea and I'll have um, my lunch. I pack a journal as well so that I can go through and just write down whatever I'm thinking or whatever I'm wondering about. And I do keep a list down the side of the birds that I see. So I'm not totally anti-listing. What I do is I I allow that part of my brain to go. Great. And so I just kind of put it down the side column of my, my journal page. And then I allow all those other questions to flow. So that's, that's kind of my perfect day of of slow birding in the winter time, somewhere where I get to move, somewhere where I get to chill out. I've got warm food to eat and and tea to drink. um, And I can spend time in one place um, and allow those birds to come back in around me. That sounds absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much for sharing your slow birding practice with us. It's absolutely fascinating. And um, I'm sure that people would want to find more about it. So where can they find you online? Yeah. So if you put Bird Diva into a Google search, I think I'm going to come up. So my website is birddiva.com and I am on Instagram as well as Bird Diva and search for slow birding community. And that will hopefully pop up for you too as well. But you'll find links to that through my website. I loved speaking with Bridget. She has a way of making me feel really energised and ready to try new things. And I like the idea of slow birding being added to our, I guess, toolkit of the ways that we bird. And depending on your mood or what you want to get out of the session, I think slow birding is something we could all benefit from trying. Bridget's next online intro to slow birding course starts in October. And she's very generously offered listeners to the Casual Birder podcast a 25% reduction in the course fee. Just use Casual Birder 25 at checkout. And I'll pop that in the episode notes for you too. Do keep in touch. Tell me about your sightings by leaving me a message or voicemail using the contact form on my website, casualbirder.com. And maybe consider signing up for the Casual Birder Bird Club. We meet virtually once a month to share our birding stories or to watch talks from special guests. We have members from around the world. Why not join us? And don't forget, come and be part of the Casual Birder podcast team for the October Big Day. And if you'd like to support the show, we have a tip jar at ko-fi.com where you can buy me a virtual coffee. And a very big thanks to Sean for supporting the show since the last episode. Take a look at the episode notes for all of the links. My thanks to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at dronesmusic.net. 
Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Casual Birder podcast.